Um, onto this um, London House Bar meeting um, on the elections. Um, uh, we have uh, John Rees, who's going to um, uh, introduce the meeting, um, talk sort of about the elections and also the um, startling news um, today about the um, about the, um, the sacking of um, Lutfi Rahman. Um, so we'll then have uh, questions um, and some, you know, discussion around uh, analysis and what we should do, um, and then, um, yeah, and then we'll sum up. So, John, let's speak for about 20 minutes. Okay. Um, well, I'll deal first of all with the sort of general political situation and the election, and then towards the end um, try and put what's happening in Tower Hamlets into, uh, into that kind of context. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, let's just kind of see if we can describe the political situation that's existed really in this country, um, I would say, for at least um, at least 10 years, really, certainly from, uh, I would say, a bit longer than that, actually, from the beginnings of the anti-capitalist movement in uh, 1989 and all the way through the period of the Afghan and Iraq wars and their aftermath and through the um, uh, the austerity program that came in the wake of the 2008 financial crash and I would say if you had to, to um, pinpoint one critical thing about that political environment it would be the growing gap between the entire establishment political structure and what most people in the country are worth thinking and doing and some of that coincided with longer term trends so for instance um, there has been a, a hemorrhaging of the membership of the mainstream parties over quite a long, period, much longer period of time. Actually, the Labour Party in this country used to have uh, a million members. It's now got um, something below uh, 200,000 members. Similarly, the Tory Party used to exist on a similar scale. It's down to about 120. Uh, thousand members now. To be honest, if you've got the three mainstream political parties uh, together, uh, their entire uh, membership, um, you'd not get a lot more uh, probably than a couple of football stadiums worth in a population which is now 60 or 70 uh, million people. So the kind of connections between the establishment political parties and their base and ordinary p people in this country has corroded, eroded over quite a long period of time and that's been faster in the last uh, 10 years than probably any any previous previous period. If you look at the share of the vote in general elections that the mainstream uh, parties get, you get the same story. It used to be, um, back in the 60s and 70s, it would be the case um, that the main uh, establishment parties, Labour, Tories to a lesser extent, uh, the Liberals, would be getting something like 80 or 90 percent of the electorate uh, voting uh, voting for them. Um, now that's down to a figure of about uh, 60 uh, percent. It'll be lower actually in uh, in this election for the mainstream for the mainstream parties. If you look at turnout in uh, general elections, um, uh, the, the, until 10 years ago, uh, turnout in this country was 70% uh, or over. Um, it will be, it, it, it slumped um, to its lowest point um, this century, uh, in the last hundred years, um, it slumped uh, to something like 59% two elections ago, uh, then it was 62% at the last election because it was a bit more closely fought, it was 65%. But those are relatively low, low, low figures. It, it means that uh, the number of people who didn't vote in the last election uh, was bigger than the number that voted uh, for the victorious party and almost as big as the figure for the victorious party and the defeated party added together. So one way or another there's quite a big um, crisis of confidence um, between the mass of people and the establishment political structures. And if you look at the, the British Social Attitude Survey, which is the, the government's own survey of public opinion, it's the, the most extensive um, and, uh, and thorough survey that it is, um, in answer to the question, which of these, these institutions in British society do you have faith in? Well, nearly all of them, the graph goes like this. 
For banks, it goes like this. For the police, it goes like this. For journalists, it goes like this. For politicians, there's only one group that's got a lower standing, and that's the state agents. So um, it's, in a, it's in a pretty uh, kind of rickety state. Um, on the other hand, um, uh, that, those aren't, of course, the only, and I would argue, or the most important indicators of political engagement. If you look at other indicators of political engagement, how many people have been on a demonstration? How many people have signed a petition? How many people are engaged in some form of extra parliamentary uh, activity? Those figures over the same period have actually risen quite steeply. If you look at the opinion polls which ask people how they identify themselves politically, there's, seven, there's something in excess of seven million people who respond by saying that they're on the left or the far left in this country. That doesn't mean they're organized, certainly doesn't mean they're in organizations, but that's how they see themselves. And that's been a big uptick in the last, in the last decade or so. And it's not hard to see uh, why that would be. It's uh, participation in the anti-capitalist movement in its various forms, particularly participation in the anti-war movement, participation in the uh, solidarity movement with Palestine that's, that's produced those kind, those kind of figures. So up until relatively recently, if you were saying what's the critical thing about politics in this country, you would say actually the faith in the establishment order in uh, the main parties, in uh, voting in elections, that kind of stuff um, has uh, deteriorated quite sharply. Um, whereas the pickup in interest in politics has been to do with single issue campaigns or uh, campaigns on the street or demonstrations on that kind, that, that kind of politics. And I think if you were looking for one figure that kind of expresses that sentiment, um, now it would be Russell Brand. You know, Russell Brand is identified, you know, to his credit with uh, political activism and is also identified and has recently repeated the argument that elections aren't worth bothering with, you know, the old um, the old anarchist slogan, if voting made any difference, they'd abolish it, and so forth and so on. That kind of frame of mind, and that's got some very real strengths, obviously, in terms of participation in movements and so forth. We are a part of that that environment as well. They're probably the people that we know best, who are most active in the movements, share some or all of those of those ideas. Um, but the second thing I want to say, the second point I want to make about politics now is, I think that's has begun to change in some important ways um, relatively recently. For instance, although it's true that membership of the mainstream political parties is absolutely nosediving, that isn't true now. I mean, if you, really, a year ago, it would have been, that was all you could say. That would be all there would be to say about membership of political parties. But now it's very definitely not all there is to say. There has been a huge surge, obviously, in membership of the Scottish National Party, the National Party after um, the referendum in Scotland. That was a that was a very interesting moment, the referendum in Scotland, because although it was lost, what it combined was the kind of energy, mass mobilisation, participation in a, in a campaign that we would characteristically think. Um, was like the participation in the Palestine demonstrations or like the participation in the anti-war movement or like the big anti-capitalist demonstrations except it was for the purposes of mainstream electoral politics albeit a referendum not an election and the aftermath of that has been to carry that momentum on um, into party politics the SNP grew massively in the wake of that and is still growing massively has now over a hundred thousand members i think it's now probably the third if not the second uh biggest uh membership political organization uh in the united kingdom except it's not in the united kingdom it's just in scotland so it's got a membership which if it were sort of averaged out across the country would be the biggest membership and of course it's far bigger than either of the tories well the tories in scotland obviously you know as the, uh, as, the, as the old and accurate, uh, old by now, but still accurate joke goes, there are more pandas in Edinburgh Zoo than there are Tory MPs in Scotland. But it's bigger than the Labour Party uh, as well, bigger than the Liberal Democrats in Scotland. The Green Party has had a n not so dramatic increase in membership, but still a very rapid increase in, in, in membership in, in, recent, in recent months. And um, I think that was the first thing that was telling us 
that, that there was an impact of that mood of disillusionment with the mainstream parties at Westminster, which now wasn't just limited to extra parliamentary movements and extra parliamentary politics, but was having an impact inside the electoral uh, the electoral sphere. And really everything that's happened during the British general election has underwritten, underlined that fact. The response to the leaders' debate, well, the fact that the leaders' debate had to include the Scottish National Party and the Greens and Plaid Cymru totally altered the dynamic because suddenly it wasn't that there were, you know, three candidates, um, one of which was from the neoliberal uh, economics uh, and uh, foreign wars, a second of which was for neoliberal economics and foreign wars, and a third of which was for neoliberal economic wars uh, and had a few doubts about foreign policy. That's the maximum spectrum of division between Labour, in policy terms, between Labour, um, uh, the Liberal Democrats and, and the Tories. Now, in those leaders' debates, there were people saying, no, we reject uh, neoliberal economics. We reject austerity. One of the most Googled words after the first leaders debate was what does austerity mean because suddenly it was being debated it wasn't just assumed that it would be the second or one of the highest google uh, questions um, after the first leaders debate was how can i vote snp in london um, and you can see suddenly um, on both sides of the political divide actually there's enormous interest in politicians who look and sound different to the establishment uh, parties, and there is a tremendous fear that's gripped the establishment. I mean, that's where the you know the Mail front page with a picture of Nicola Sturgeon saying the most dangerous woman in Britain, which you know, you know, when you think about it, can't conceivably be true. Um, <laughs> there are you know probably female mass murderers out there, you know, or, or indeed senior figures in the armed forces, etc., who've got guns and shit, you know. So um, that. No, now is, is, a, is a very real, a meaningful political division inside normal party and electoral politics. The fear of the SNP by the establishment is twofold. One, they may hold the balance of power at Westminster, they may get to decide which the next government is, and the fear is, of course, uh, that they'll extract a kind of left-wing political price uh, for that. But even more seriously, the political establishment thought that they had finished with the question of Scottish independence by getting the no vote in the referendum. And it's now absolutely clear, whatever the SNP say during the election campaign, that that is likely to reappear on the political agenda. And so you will have, for the first time since 1707, a group of people in this country who say we are so hacked off with Westminster politics that, frankly, we'd rather not be part of this any longer and that will be a, a dramatic crisis for the British state. It hasn't faced anything like this in, uh, well not since Irish independence at the beginning of the, of, of the, of the 20th century and it's reacting actually to the SNP very much in the way um, that the polity, mainstream politicians then reacted uh, to, Irish, uh, to Irish Republicans. So I think suddenly, um, as we titled this meeting, suddenly the politics of the election have got interesting because what was previously outside the sphere of electoral politics is now inside the sphere of electoral politics and it's creating a certain amount of havoc, disorientation um, for the ruling class. And I think the Tories have run a spectacularly bad election campaign because they just don't know what to do with this situation. I mean, where I work, Old Street, there is now an illuminated Conservative Party uh, billboard up which says, stop Miliband and the SNP. I mean, quite what that means in Hoxton, you know, I mean, I know what it's supposed to mean, you're supposed to vote Tory as a result of this, but I mean, as a message, do they really think that, you know, sort of the denizens of Hoxton are staring up and saying, fuck me, if I don't vote Tory, we'll get the SNP. You know, most people are thinking, whoa, if I, maybe if I, I'll get the SNP if we're really lucky. Um, so, I mean, I just, I just think it's, it's careered out of their control in certain, in certain, important, uh, in certain important ways. Um, and this is important not because I'm suddenly become a devotee of electoral politics. I don't actually think that electoral politics are a, a fundamental or effective way of making substantial social change. I don't think it comes through uh, an electoral route. I, I don't believe um, that uh, even a convinced left-wing party in power has the ability to change the structure of society 
uh, in those ways. And the crisis that's around Syriza, who are at least attempting this, rather underlines uh, this point. You know, I learned this early in life when I read about the Wilson Labour governments of the first Wilson go government, actually, uh, of 64, um, when Wilson came to power with a, with a mod with, in a boom, in a long boom, where they had the money, came to power with a moderate, very moderate uh, programme of reforms. And the Lord Cromer, who was then governor of the Bank of England, came to him and said, and this is in the memoirs, says, um, you know, you know you aren't going to be able to implement this programme, don't you? And Wilson said to him, come off it. I'm the elected prime minister. We just won a majority. I'm going to implement this programme. So Cromer said, well, all right, have it your own way. Uh, two weeks later, there was a run on the pound. Uh, Cromer came back to him and said, you know you aren't going to implement these policies, don't you? And they didn't. And that was, that was the best chance, the best economic conditions this country has ever had for that kind of program to be implemented. So I'm not an advocate of that, uh, of that um, idea, the Labour Party idea that we can get into power, was the Labour Party idea, is now the, SW, the SNP idea or the Green Party idea or the Syriza idea. I, I don't believe it comes down that road. I think the, the ruling class is too extensive that it exists far outside the confines of of Parliament, it exists in the civil service, in the army, in the police, in the corporate boardrooms, and that power always overwhelms even a well-meaning or determined left-wing uh, left government. But having said all that, what happens in the political sphere, what happens in parliamentary politics, affects the prospects of change coming outside. It affects how confident people are. People who are building a mass movement against the war or fighting against austerity are empowered by or encouraged by or motivated by seeing that argument being raised inside the political spectrum. They may or they may like us not think that this is where change comes but if you're in the trade union branch or if you're in an anti-cuts group or if you're in the stop the war movement seeing that argument articulated encourages you, it encourages me. You know Trident is not supposed to be ever discussed in a British general election and nuclear weapons are never supposed to be a, Marty, a matter of what they call party political division. They agree that these things are set aside and not debated. Suddenly, because of the SNP, Trident is an election issue in this country and that can't help but assist everybody in CND and stop the war who's opposed to Trident. So, the, so even though I don't believe in parliamentary politics, what I do believe is that parliamentary politics affects the way in which extra parliamentary politics are conducted, it affects the confidence, the ability to fight, the way in which people articulate ideas. And those people, like Russell Brand and many of the people in Occupy and whatnot, who don't think this, it's it's kind of I always think that sort of you know it's kind of anarchism or autonomism or that kind of view. It's, it's all socialism without brains or socialism without politics. They're not thinking that just because we reject this method of change, that millions of people who don't yet reject it especially, and even people who do, will be affected by what happens inside this world. It matters, and it matters to their lives about how things change, how they view politics, what they think is important, what they think is legitimate to say. You know, if Nicola Sturgeon has been saying this on the television last night, why shouldn't I walk into my workplace the next day and say, hey, I think Trident's rubbish. You know, it's different if that's part of a national political discourse than if it isn't part of a national political discourse. So I think that matters, and I think the, uh, the elite are, are on to closing that down. They know the effect it has, and that's the most dangerous thing in the world, uh, in the world for them, and they're systematically at the business of trying to close down those, uh, those options. And I think for exactly the equal but opposite reason, we should be magnifying that voice and that debate and that discussion. I think what's happening in Tower Hamlets is a variant of the same thing. I mean, after all, what is the Tower Hamlets Council? It's a council which defeated, the Tower Hamlets first people, defeated both the Labour machine and the Tory machine uh, in Tower Hamlets. And the Labour machine in Tower Hamlets is a rotten uh, Labour, Labour machine, which has relied on Bangladeshi votes for years, but never allows Bangladeshi politicians to run uh, their own, uh, own organisation. It's an anti-austerity council insofar as it can within the limits. It's an anti-war council and a pro-Palestine council. And it is, incidentally, look for Rahman, the first ever directly elected Muslim mayor in this country. That's why it's a target. It's not for what they've done wrong, and they may have done things wrong. They're not being hunted for what they've done wrong. They're being hunted for what they've done right. They're being hunted because they are 
uh, certainly in that part of London, they are a pole of attraction for everybody who doesn't like establishment politics, who doesn't like racism, who thinks that Muslims should stand up for themselves, who doesn't like war, who is pro-Palestine. That's what they represent politically. That's why Eric Pickles sent in the, the commissioners. And once the Tory government had decided to send in the commissioners um, and take over elements of the, of the running of the council, that's a political signal for the whole establishment that these people are fair game. You can go after these people. And I don't believe if the judge hadn't been operating in an environment, and firstly, where Islamophobic ideas are acceptable, secondly, where Eric Pickles has signaled that the government will be happy to be rid of this, that he would have come to the series of judgments that he did, uh, that he came to uh, today. And some of the things that he said, for instance, in the statement in court, which he then refused to release, the full judgment is released, 200 pages of it, you can read it if you have trouble sleeping at night, but the summary statement that he made in court, he's refused to release, and I'm not surprised because it says some absolutely outrageous things. It says, uh, for instance, um, that, um, that Muslims in Tower Hamlets aren't a minority, aren't a minority because there's so many of them living in this part of the town. Now, let's take a step back and think what that would mean. That would mean that nobody could be an oppressed minority in any area of the country where there were substantial, I mean there's only 55% by the way, just to, technically just over a majority in, even in Tower Hamlet. But imagine what that would mean. It would mean you could only be an oppressed minority if you live in a country town. If there's five of you living in a village in Suffolk, you can be oppressed, but you can't be oppressed if you live in Tower Hamlets even though a moment's thought will tell you that the outrageous rates of stop and search which the Metropolitan Police operate against uh, Muslims and ethnic minorities, they happen in Tower Hamlets just like anywhere else. That the rocketing figures now for hate crimes against Muslims, and the Metropolitan Police have just released figures showing they increased 100% over last year. Do you think those don't happen in Tower Hamlets? No, they happen disproportionately in, in, in Tower Hamlets. As if, does, he, does the judge imagine that the Bangladeshis who were living in rotten private uh, housing stock or decaying council buildings are now living down in the converted yuppie warehouses on the Thames or in Canary Wharf. No, if you're a Muslim in Tower Hamlets, you are uh, uh, suffering from all those things, from underemployment, from poor wages, from poor health, um, disproportionately. That's what it means. And um, that's why the look for Rahman uh, organization got elected in the first place precisely out of that and for um, and for the judge to say for instance that people were misled by spiritual influence now does he really imagine that even if every last imam in Tower Hamlets is saying one thing that Muslims are so different from the rest of the population so uniquely backward so uniquely enthralled to their religion more than say Jews in Golders Green um, that they won't decide how they're going to vote? Does he not realise that in many of those council elections the Labour candidate was a Muslim and the Ta Hamlet's first candidate was also a Muslim? So that must have been really confusing if you were if you were just voting on spiritual lines. Are we going to make void every election in this uh, island nation um, where religion is a factor? Because I'll tell you what, there won't be many MPs sitting in Parliament from Northern Ireland after the next election if that's true because only the Protestants vote for the Unionists and only the Catholics vote for the SDLP and the Republicans. So that spiritual influence is going to have a bit of a problem if we're going to take it on that basis. And to use that piece of legislation, by the way, the, the judge had to pick out an archaic piece of, uh, of legislation used last uh, to stop Irish priests influencing Catholics against the British occupiers at the time of empire. Now there's something wrong with a judge that's operating on, on this basis. It's not about what's the business of how they did or didn't run the election. It's about trying to stop a center of resistance in the same way as they're trying to stop Nicola Sturgeon. So I think the election is vastly different than I thought it would be six months ago. It's um, a, a sign of the sort of impact of 10 or 15 years of decay of the system and it's beginning to produce some alternatives. They're not necessarily the alternatives that I'd want, but they are beginning to break down the grip of the establishment parties. And I think after uh, the election, I think May the 8th is going to be a very interesting day. And I think moving <coughs> forward from then, politics won't be the same as it's been before this.
Uh, hello, I'm Ron. I've been in an election campaign in St Hamlet. When Galloway was elected, we made complaints about Labour Party electoral fraud on a huge scale um, to the returning officer in Tower Hamlets and to the police. I'll tell you what happened to those complaints. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Partly because, guess what? The returning officer in Tower Hamlets at that time was the partner of a Labour MP. And they got a Labour establishment, John Biggs, before him Michael Keith, which has been running that place as if it was a colonial operation for years. So, yeah, I'm definitely in favour of uh, a widespread investigation of electoral fraud in Tower Hamlets and one of the things it would find is if there was fraud by Tower Hamlets first in the last election there will have been fraud by the Labour Party in the last election as well because it happens in Tower Hamlets it's not the only place it happens but it happens in Tower Hamlets usually the way in which electoral investigations treat the question of fraud is this they say yes it existed was it sufficient to alter the outcome of this election and only if they determined that it was sufficient for that to happen do they rerun the election. That's standard electoral procedure. There couldn't conceivably have been the level of fraud in the last election, given look for Rahman's majority, for it to have affected um, the, it, the outcome. And a, as I say, a full investigation, I think, would also reveal that they weren't the only people, if they were, involved in it. So that's my attitude to that, uh, to that issue, and if anybody asks me, am I in favour of being investigated? Yes, I am. Do I think it takes place? Yes, I do. Who do I think invented it? The Labour Party. Where do I think historically it's taken uh, place most uh, 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 widespread? In the Labour Party. That's my, my, my view about that. But I've got one other thing to say about this as well, because it always goes like this when there's a polarisation around uh, a political challenge. To the, um, to the establishment. They go, they go for left-wingers on sex and money. That's what they do. That's what the press does. So during the miners' strike, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, if, you, if you weren't there at the time, you can't believe what a, what a furore this was. was. Was Arthur Scargill getting money from Colonel Gaddafi and the Libyans? The, the bank accounts have to be open. Is he getting... This went on for week after week. Now, nobody even remembers it now. I don't, I don't even remember whether he was or he wasn't. I think he probably was. But you know what? I didn't care. I really didn't care. Because the, the thing was this. Yeah, not everybody's on our, on our side is the same, of course. Not everybody on our side that I'm fighting with do I actually agree with about politics. Look for as a reformist. I'm not. I'm a revolutionary. I don't agree with him that getting into local council or... I don't agree with that. But when there's a division, and on one side there's the judiciary, the racists, the Tories, and when there's on our side there's some people who maybe I've got some disagreements with and haven't done everything right, I know which side I'm coming up on. I didn't agree with Arthur Scargill about everything, but I knew that it was going to be a very, very important battle and bad things would happen if people who weren't necessarily saints on our side lost that battle, and that's the what it always breaks. It always breaks like like this. So you have to say what you think, but you have to pick your side as well, and that's kind of basic. I think. Um, on how to vote, um, my my view of this uh, is that um, most people will approach most working people, most people that we would want to talk to and have a political conversation with are going towards this election thinking we've got to get rid of the Tories. And I agree with them about that. Number one goal in this election is get rid of the Tories. Because, and I don't, I don't ever vote, by the way, just on policy. You know, because if you look at, it's changed a bit and there's some differences. And some of those differences are important. Even if they're small differences, there can be important things in the lives of working people. So I don't neglect, neglect those. But I do it on the basis of two things. One that uh, Elaine talked about is what will be the effect of this vote on the people who are doing the serious fighting, on stop the war activists, on Palestinian activists? What will be the impact of this on trade union representatives and shop stewards, the people who hold the labour movement together? And I know that if a Tory hangs on in power, they'll be demoralised and less likely to fight. And if the Tories are kicked out, They'll, be, they'll have their heads up a bit. They may not like the thing that comes next, 
best, but I think at least the at least we got rid of those fuckers. At least the Eaton boys aren't there any longer. At least the working class in this gum in this country's got enough gumption to kick out the their declared class enemies. That's the way I, I look at it. And the other thing is, I think what not what is the policy of the party, but what is the party? What is it made up of? And the Tories are the open and declared party of big business in this country. They are linked to it by family ties. They do it as a their main job, but they're also being MPs. When they finish being MPs, that's what they'll go and do. The people they listen to most of big business, the people they love are Rupert Murdoch, the people they listen to are the heads of BP, and when they can appoint them as lords, they do. That's one of the problems about the lords, by the way. They've appointed so many people. It's The number of lords in this country is so big that they can't even all sit together, could they stagger in to the actual House of Lords at any one time. So they are the open and declared party of big business. What is the Labour Party? It compromises all the time, it can't deliver on what it wants to do, it keeps adopting Tory policies, but that isn't what it is. What it is, is a party of working people funded and created by the trade unions in this country. And however far Tony Blair worked to destroy that, that still essentially is its character. So the character of these two political organisations are different and the effects of voting on them, on ordinary activists, is different for that reason. So that's how I judge it. So by and large, I vote Labour, unless there's a credible left alternative. If there is a credible left alternative, by which I don't mean, by the way, people who are declaring socialist revolution are going to get 1.6% of the vote. That's a waste of time. It's a waste of a vote to do that. I've stood in the left, like I said, I've been in serious organisations, where there's a serious chance, not even if you're winning, but at least if you're building a left alternative, then of course I'm for that. That's what I'd vote for. But if that doesn't exist, then don't waste your time on losing your deposit. Um, better not to stand in those circumstances. Better not to waste the money and the time of activists in an electoral field, which you don't even think is the most important thing in it anyway. So you might as well do something else. Um, in some places, I think the Greens have got good candidates. In some places, I think they've got bad candidates. If I was in Brighton, I'd vote for Caroline Lucas. In my constituency, in Hackney South, I won't vote for the Greens because they're bloody right wing. I'd rather vote for Labour. And even though Labour got a clear majority, I'd rather see, when they total up what the total Labour vote is, I'd rather have contributed to that. My mum and my sister, you know, live in a Tory town in, in Wiltshire, and I'd say to them, and well, I come from a Labour family anyway, but always vote Labour because the total number of Labour votes matters as well as what you're doing in your constituency. It may matter more than ever in this election because the Tories may end up with more seats than Labour with a, but with a lower percentage of the votes. And one of the things that will delegitimise them is if we can say to them, you're a minority party. You may have more seats because the electoral system doesn't work, but Labour has the most votes. And that will matter. It can matter this time around. So that's my attitude to who to, uh, who to vote for. Um, sorry, too quickly. Uh, uh, but both about what Paul said about constitutional reform, yeah, it's not the most important thing, but it's like, it's like everything else. Even though I want to totally transform, transform the system, anything that makes the system better encourages people to make more change. It's like, I, I want an, e an economy that doesn't depend on wages and people being employed by employers at all. I want to abolish the wages system. But I never say to people, don't fight for higher wages. No, get the higher wages, and that'll encourage you to think you can transform the, the whole system. I don't think that a better constitution is the answer, but I'd rather have a better constitution than the worst one. I'd rather have more democracy than less, because that gives people more power and engagement. And once they've done that, they'll think, maybe I can do something uh, even bigger. And that's the way I look at it with Syriza as well. No, Syriza's not perfect. It's not the answer. But, hell, but hey, it's a lot better than having the Christian Democrats, the Greek Tories, in power, and at least when Syriza is in power, people are saying, okay, we've got a left-wing government, it isn't doing as much as we want, how can we get what we want? So they're having a debate which has already lurched three or four steps to the left because they did that. So I always think you work in two registers. You work on what's my end goal, where do I want to be, but also how can I best put that argument and what will best advance that argument with other people who haven't yet reached that conclusion. So I'm constantly moving between the end of the day goal and where the people around me are at that moment and trying to shape an argument to lead them from one to the other so they intellectually begin to travel that distance.
I'll come back for a few minutes. Yeah, briefly. Um, I mean, I think the point that Paul made about the Electoral Commission, I'd forgotten it. If I'd remembered it, I would have put it in the article, but it's very important. The Electoral Commission did actually um, agree that there hadn't been fraud in Tat Hamlets, and these private prosecutions were brought because of that, uh, because of that try and, if you like, overturn um, that, uh, that decision. Um, the only other thing I'd sort of reply to, I mean, it's been a very good discussion, I've, in, I've enjoyed it, no doubt it'll continue all the way through and after the election. But I then want to address the question which a number of people, David and others, raised about, the, and Alex, about the, the media. You see, on, on one reading, um, there should never be any resistance at all. I mean, they do control the entirety of the press, they do control government, they do control the education system. Uh, it should be like 1984 in George Orwell's novel. It should be that the government is all-powerful, that it produces these ideologies, that an atomized mass just accepts it and can literally not think outside the box that they're given by the authorities. Now, why, isn't it that, why is that not the case? Because it patently obviously isn't the case. Why is it not the case? It's not the case for this reason. Because the received opinion is only half of how people actually form their own opinion. Received opinion from the authorities, from the press, from the education system is one part of the story. But the other part of the story is people's direct experience of the system. Their direct day-to-day -day experience or their experience um, of other people they know and trust telling them about the system. So you can tell people that it's your fault you're unemployed because you're a miserable, lazy bugger and you shouldn't have any benefits whatsoever. But most people are unemployed. No, that isn't the case. They've worked hard all their lives. Um, you can tell pensioners that you're feather-bedded and you're not entitled to your pension and you're depriving the younger generation of this, that and the other. You can tell students that, you know, really, what's wrong with you guys paying up nine grand? It's good for the system, good for you, it's the way it should be. You can say all these things, but the direct experience of unemployed people, of students, of pensioners, directly contradicts this in their everyday, in their everyday lives. And if there's one thing that's more powerful than received opinion, it's your own experience and the opinion based on your own experience. And those two things exist in tension all the time. People half believe what they're told, and they half believe ideas that they've got from somewhere else. This experience, not just their personal experience, but the kind of built up experience. I mean, in my family, for instance, my father came from South Wales. So no matter what anybody else thought about Winston Churchill, in my house, he could be a war hero, he could be a national figure, the best prime minister we've ever had. But in my house growing up, Winston Churchill was a bastard. And he was a bastard because when he was Home Secretary, he ordered the troops to fire on South Wales miners when they were on strike. And that was the end of it for my father. There was no discussion. This was not a matter of debate in my, in my, in my family. Winston Churchill was a bastard, period. That was it. <laughs> and, and believe me, uh, in, in, the, in the houses of, uh, of ex-miners to this day, no matter what they're doing now, whether they're working in B&Q, whether they're driving taxis, people who went through the 1984-85 miners' strike, policemen are bastards, period. If you're related, if you're in Liverpool, you don't buy the Sun because of what it wrote about Hillsborough, because it wrote that the fans were responsible. So the Sun has never recovered its sales in, in Hillsborough for this, uh, for this reason. So, and these ideas get passed down institutionally through families, through membership of trade unions, through being in socialist organisations, through thousands of different ways that run counter to the, establishment, to, the, to the establishment story. So our business is to maximise that opinion and push out the received opinion and not allow the received opinion to push out that experience. How do you do that? Organisation and action. A deed is a more powerful generator of a thought than another thought. I mean, I'm for the other thought. I'm for the critique and the argument and taking up the history. And of course, you know, I, I do a lot of it, so I'm definitely in, in favour of that. But there is nothing as powerful as experience. You can teach people about the history of the police and the courts, but if you go on a picket line and you're hit by a policeman, believe me, that stays with you for the rest of your life. You won't need two versions of that, uh, of that experience. So, what to do about that is to be organisers of experience. That's what we did with the anti-war movement. People would have not liked the Iraq war, whether or not we'd done anything about it. 
But the fact that we did do something about it, magnified that dislike, organised it, made it a political fact, generalised such a big opinion in this country that opinion polls for 13 years have been against war in this country and forced eventually the House of Commons to vote against attacking Syria. It was such a serious thing and it even got through to MPs. So that's the way you do it. We're organised of experience. Now I'm talking to Ollie Rahman, who now has become, was the Deputy Mayor, he's now the Mayor of Hamlet, um, and others in town, because I want to have, and I've said to them, we ought to have a rally in Tower Hamlets on Sunday saying, we want our mayor back. We don't want a judge or the Tories telling us who elects the mayor in this borough. Now, if that happens, there will be a story in the press about it. That will be a counter argument. I mean, it'll be a terrible story, by the way. They'll be saying, what the hell's going on? Look, they're so mad. They don't accept it. They're all corrupt. They don't look at that. But there'll be a debate. There'll be an argument. And all those people who are today are thinking, oh, well, maybe there was, maybe he did something wrong. Say, so, whoa, look, there's 500 people in town. I was just saying they don't like this. And that will change the terms of the debate. So organisation, doing stuff, the deed is almost more powerful, or it's a, a, an essential prerequisite of winning an intellectual or theoretical argument. If you don't act, you won't change anybody's mind. If you do act, then the basis exists in people's experience for their mind to be changed. And the sun, by the way, even at its height, um, a majority of sun voters always voted Labour. Because you shouldn't assume about sun readers any more than you assume about anybody else that they believe what they read. Perhaps they don't even buy it for the politics. Perhaps they buy it for the crossword. Or page three, which might not be good, but they don't accept the point. Or the sport. Or the racing tips. I don't know. But they don't believe what they read. They got their ideas, their political ideas, from somewhere else. And it's always that. That's what we're working on. We're working on the basis that there's another set of ideas out there that can be articulated, organised, amplified.